tonight we'll talk about faith and mental health, which is a little bit more of a practical question, but one that I'm really excited to talk about. Um, so we'll, we'll start um, on a dark and stormy night 15 years ago. I was 11 years old um, and I was praying to God because I was really distressed and didn't understand what was going on for me. Um, that was the year that I'd been diagnosed with depression. And among many other things that were difficult about that, I felt really, really um, distressed that I was failing God somehow. I had learned that Christians were supposed to be happy and people were supposed to kind of want to know about God from our infectious joy. And I was finding myself to be very critical and very gloomy and sometimes even um, hateful. And I wasn't motivated to do very much. Uh, and there's there a lot of stuff inside myself that I, I didn't know where it was coming from. Um, and so I felt like I was sinning. I felt so guilty. I didn't know really how to stop, although I had tried for a good portion of the year. And at this point, you're probably wondering why the image I chose was a cookie on fire. Um, and I don't know that I'm going to actually be able to explain this story in a way that's going to make sense of the cookie on fire. All that I'll say is <laughs> I remember that specific night uh, because it's the night that I had the most profound experience of God's love um, that I've ever had in my life when I prayed about this. But um, before that, I had looked to everything else for comfort aside from God. <laughs> and one of the things I'd looked to was a chocolate chip cookie and I put it in the microwave and um, I put it and I thought it was 20 seconds, but it was two minutes and the cookie caught on fire. Um, and so that's just a part of that night that I remember um, and thought it would just be interesting to have as a visual. And that was also the moment that I actually was inspired to go talk to God instead of continuing to look to other sources for comfort. Um, so yeah, no, 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 feel, feel good about laughing because it is hysterical. I kind of think like Moses had a burning bush and I had an on fire cookie. Um, so anyway, this presentation, um, you know, I've, I'm um, studying to be a therapist, a clinical psychologist, and hopefully in six weeks, that's exactly what I'll be. So fingers crossed guys. Um, and I've <laughs> been doing uh, been doing therapy for a while now uh, as part of my program. So I've been, a, I've been a, functioning as a therapist under supervision for the past four or five years. Um, and so I've been on a journey of kind of trying to understand this question and questions like it um, for a while. And so I'll kind of partly structure this presentation as what I'd be saying to my 11 year old self um, to help her understand more fully what was going on. Um, so these questions that we're going to explore then are like, where do these mental health problems come from on a Christian perspective? And I might talk more about depression because that's what I was experiencing when I was 11. Um, but this could be anxiety. It could be OCD. It could be all sorts of, of different things that are going on. So we're going to be kind of more taking a bird's eye view. Um, I'm more than happy in the question and answers to talk about some more specific things, but this is going to be a bird's eye view. So mental health in general, and maybe more geared towards depression because that's kind of the case example we're using. Um, and then should Christians go to therapy? I feel like that's an important question. Um, and for some people, the answer might be really simple and obvious. And for other people, that might be more complicated. And so we'll just talk about that briefly. And then we'll just revisit again, kind of how does faith interact with mental health? Um, and that's our plan for today. So question number one is where do mental health problems come from on a Christian perspective? Um, so the first thing that we have to do is look at like, where are our sources of knowledge to answer that question? Where is a good place to look for an answer to that question? And so um, as Christians, of course, one of the first places we'll often turn is the word of God. Um, and so that's an important source. And, and, and there's a lot of different components in the scriptures. There's a lot of different genres that we have. And so, they're going to speak to us in different ways. So there are images in the narrative of scripture that help us understand the human condition and the, the mental suffering that we might experience. Um, there's theological teachings um, in the epistles and in other places that kind of more directly talk about those types of things. Um, there is our examples set and uh, rules of life that are set in the law and in other places. But two places, two things I'll highlight. Um, so I 
come from a Christian graduate school program. Um, and so we do something called integration of psychology and theology. Um, and we really spend a lot of time in our program looking at the overlap of psychology and theology and maybe any conflict that can come out of that and, all, and the ways that, that enhances it. Um, and so if we look at what psychology is um, and psychology meaning therapy, um, it falls under a specific genre of scripture um, called wisdom literature. That's kind of the strongest overlap. So you've got prophets, you've got priests, you've got kings, and you've also got sages or, or wise people in the Bible. Um, and there's a whole genre dedicated to that. And that's where you're going to see Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Um, poetry as well can kind of fit in on that. Um, and so that's an important genre to bear in mind, which I'll talk about in a second. And then also we learn um, about psychology and our, our study of psychology and theology is guided through what bears fruit. So we learn that you can tell a good teacher or a good teaching by the fruit that it bears. And that's an important thing to hold in mind. Um, so what do I mean by wisdom? Because that's really important when we're looking at the scripture and trying to understand how it helps us to understand our own psychology. Um, this is a, these are Proverbs, right? They're right. They're two verses of Proverbs right next to each other. One says, do not answer a fool according to his folly or you yourself will be just like him. But then the next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly or he will be wise in his own eyes. And so I feel like we often come to scripture and we're wanting a really clear answer about what's going on with us. We want to know exactly what we should do and how to do it right. Um, and psychology um, and wisdom are disciplines that don't have clear cut answers. Like this is definitely what's gonna solve your problem. Um, and that doesn't mean that the Bible isn't a place that we come to bring those problems. But what you see with these two verses is they don't give you an answer about what to do with a fool if he's talking folly. You don't exactly know what to do. There's two options and really wisdom is knowing which one to choose at which time. There's a discernment process. It's something that emerges out of interacting with the scriptures, with a text, right? It's something that emerges from experience and wisdom um, that you gain through experiences that you have interacting with a bunch of fools, <laughs> right? Um, and so it, this is a very living part of the word of God. And so that's why often when we're wrestling through questions of mental health and psychology, it falls in that wisdom category. And there's not always clear cut answers that you know exactly what to do to get rid of anxiety or to get rid of depression. If it comes a much more complicated question, it doesn't mean that the Bible isn't talking about it. It just means it's a different kind of question and you get a different kind of interaction from the text on it. Um, so another source that we have as Christians that are, is often very valued by um, believers is church history. Um, and so I don't have as much content on this, but all to, uh, to say that there is a tradition in church history of going to wise people, going to physicians of the soul, um, to help you understand yourself better. Because there's this acknowledgement that we can't figure it all out by ourselves and that there's a benefit to going to someone who actually intentionally spends time um, learning how to sit with people and what they're experiencing and, and learning how to develop the wisdom to know what's going on at any given moment. And so we've got this quote from Origen, um, Christians should look carefully for a physician of souls to whom they could confess their sin and lay bare the cause of their ailment who knows how to be infirm with the infirm. So there's again that emphasis on the wisdom that a person can, um, a person has if they are engaged in this and, and that's the kind of person you maybe wanna seek out. And then finally, as Christians, we have access to general revelation and common grace. Um, and so one of the things that's often said in my program that I really value that I've really taken in is all truth is God's truth. So we don't need to be afraid of um, scientific studies that come out about human psychology. Um, we don't need to be afraid of wisdom that other people, maybe who aren't even Christian, have gained about people's mental health and what's healing and helpful for them. Um, there's a very specific kind of uh, wisdom that comes from people, uh, whether they're a therapist or some sort of counselor where they're sitting with people for hours and hours and hours and, and trying to learn how to be helpful and be a part of the healing process. Um, and then also if they're studying the scientific literature at the same time, there's a very unique kind of clinical um, intuition and wisdom that comes out of that. Um, and so if there are truths present in that and they are true, then it, it's, it is God's truth, whether it's 
um, expressed in a way that we're familiar with in a Bible verse or whether it's something that's said in a different kind of way. There's, it all belongs to God. And just to kind of emphasize that, you know, there's often the, the belief in the church and the doctrine of common grace, that the Lord's good to all, his mercy is over all he has made. And so even people who don't know Jesus directly are under this common goodness that God has given to all of us. And they will learn just like they learn about how to cure cancer and how to become dentist to care for your teeth, they're also going to be able to offer valuable things about mental health. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so if, if I'm going back and I'm thinking again about 11 year old me, um, I was really stuck in a mindset where I was mostly just thinking about sin, at least in terms of like me intentionally doing something wrong and, and trying, like, trying to figure out if I should be feeling guilty about about this thing that I was experiencing. I think now one of the first things I'd say to myself is that I have a little bit of a different understanding of the gospel. It doesn't take out that sinful piece of like what I do wrong, but it broadens it because there's there's a lot of problems that we experience as people, a lot of things that, that um, Jesus showed us a new way of doing. Um, and so um, I like this quote from Marcus J. Borg, so I'll read it to you. He says, I'm persuaded that our understanding of the heart of Christian vision of life is enriched by using multiple biblical images for the human problem and its remedy. The problem is not simply that we have been bad and rebelled against God, though that may be true, but that we are blind, estranged, lost, in exile, self-centered, wounded, sick, paralyzed, in bondage, grasping, and so forth. Forgiveness doesn't speak to these issues. And so we may very well need forgiveness. That's huge. It's, it's big. Um, but there may be other things that we need, and that might mean that the problems that we're experiencing don't just boil down to a simple answer of your, your sitting. Even if that's part of it, there might be more. And so we're going to look at that more um, together tonight. Um, and so just I'm going to hopefully share with you some stories that will help you kind of connect with what I'm talking about. Um, and some of them will be about patients that I've had. But um, actually, uh, all the stories I'm telling you are true. Every element of them is literally true. Um, but to protect people's identities and confidentiality, which is super important to me as a therapist, I'm actually kind of just like combining people and maybe changing elements and details about their life so that you really couldn't figure out who that person was and you wouldn't know their unique story. Um, but rest assured that it's all true stuff. This is not me making up a thing hypothetically. These are all things that I have heard and experienced from people often on multiple occasions. Um, so we'll, we'll start off with um, this first person um, and it'll help us kind of understand maybe one of the first things that go into mental health. Um, and this is actually somebody that I knew in high school. Um, and so when I was in 12th grade in high school, um, there was a girl whose name is Roberta and she sat at the table next to me all alone. She'd come into lunch every day. She'd put her head down on the table. It didn't look like she was really taking care of herself very well. She didn't eat. Um, just every day for all of lunch. And so I would pray before I ate my food and I just felt really convicted in my soul that I should invite her to come sit with my lunch table at that point. And I was a pretty anxious um, teenager. So I was nervous about doing that, um, but I did it. I plucked up my courage and she said, no, uh, did not want to come sit with us. So that was great. And I thought that I had done like all that I needed to do, but as I prayed about it, I felt like oh, maybe she needs to know that I really mean it. And so I felt kind of that weight on me again of like, oh, I should, I should probably ask her a second time. And so I, again, mustered up all of my, my courage and I asked her a second time and said, no, really come, come and sit with us. And so that time she did. And within a couple of weeks, maybe a month of sitting with me and the people at my table and talking with us, um, she started to eat lunch. Um, she started to um, take care of herself better she was smiling she was happy and at the end of the year she even wrote something in my yearbook and thanked me and said that i didn't really fully understand the impact that it had on her um, when i invited her to come sit with the lunch table and so one of the things that can cause stress and and pain in our mental health um, are environmental stressors these are things that are completely outside of us that we have no control over um, people might relate in covid to isolation there's been a lot of increase in mental health problems this past year because being lonely and without people is painful. That's just part of actually naturally being human is needing connection with others. Um, and you could see that in Roberta's case, she was isolated, she was alone. She probably had other stuff going on at home. 
um, schoolwork, I work with a lot of patients who are law students and they are very, very stressed people. And I'm not entirely sure that they'll be that stressed when they're out of law school. <laughs> and anybody who has a difficult major might be able to testify to that. Um, are there major life transitions like getting married or moving? Um, these types of things cause stress um, and environments that contain trauma. Um, if you put somebody in a traumatic environment and then you take them out of it, there is an incredible difference. There's a lovely study about um, rats and addiction to drugs. Um, and if you put a rat in an empty cage and you addict them to a drug, they will, uh, on heroin, then they will overdose on heroin. They won't even eat or drink, they'll, they'll starve. They'll, um, they'll get dehydrated to the point of death if you lose them in, in the cage with heroin. But if you take an addicted rat who's addicted to heroin and you put them in a cage and you um, give them things to do and other rats to play with, they will actually, um, what's the word? They will withdraw naturally on their own from drugs. They'll stop using drugs and they will engage with this environment where there's connection and social connection and things to do. Um, so environment is a really powerful thing, um, even for rats and also for people. Um, so if, if I was thinking about my 11 year old self, I would have looked at the things that were going on around me and I would have looked at uh, the stress that I was experiencing at school, not really connecting with very many friends. Um, when I was 11, that was the year that my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And so there was a lot of things in my environment that were very uncertain and very stressful, um, constantly changing and it had a deep impact on me. Um, in the Bible, we can see this in Lamentations. Um, when we're looking at the exile, we're looking at all the traumas that the people of Israel experienced. And you can hear them talking about the starvation um, and the grief and the loss. Um, and so they experienced suffering, mental suffering, um, as they were going through the process of being exiled and of picking up the pieces. Um, and there's a whole book on how to express that lament to God. It's actually a really beautiful book to study um, and dark but beautiful. So we can look at another factor. So this is, this is pretty common. There's one patient in particular that I think of when I think of this, um, a girl that came into a counseling center that I worked in. And um, there was a, a point in her life when she was a teenager, which is often when these things can start, where she started to have thoughts of wanting to hurt herself. And uh, she'd been put on medication and then she felt better, um, she wasn't having those thoughts anymore. And then she came into me and was going to experiment with going off the medication. And a couple of weeks after she went off the medication, um, those thoughts returned out of nowhere. She'd been, and nothing else in her life was going wrong. Everything was the same. And all of a sudden she had those thoughts again. And then two weeks is about as long as it takes for the particular medication that she was on to get out of her system. Um, and so then she went back on the medication and the thoughts completely disappeared again. Um, and so this is a really important factor to think about um, and talk about. Um, it's not always the only answer, but we need to talk about the biology of mental health to understand that there is something that is grounded in biology. Um, and so you've probably heard of all of the happy chemicals in your brain. We've got different ones. Um, you know, if you ever run and you felt really good or you've exercised, felt really good, that's your endorphins pumping through your system. If you've ever felt really happy after giving someone a nice long hug, that's oxytocin. Um, if you've ever checked your um, Facebook and seen a bunch of notifications and that felt really good, that's a dopamine hit. Um, and serotonin is another one of the uh, chemicals in your brain that help you experience happiness. Um, and so a really common medication that people take for depression is called, it's a type of medication, it's called an SSRI, it's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And that basically just means that it's targeting your serotonin. Um, and so you can see in this diagram, we've got, um, this is supposed to be two neurons that are next to each other. Your brain is made up of a bunch of tiny cells called neurons. Um, and um, serotonin is supposed to float around in between them. Um, that's what helps you to feel happy or just have a good mood. It's not really the same as like making you feel happy like you're high, but just in general to be able to have like a good um, stable mood. Um, and so um, it's supposed to float around in the middle. People who are depressed often 
um, have a condition where their serotonin actually hangs out inside their neurons and won't go out into the middle part where it's supposed to float around. Um, and so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors kind of block the uh, serotonin from going back up into the cell and force it to stay in between the neurons. And so people do feel better often um, or see improvements in their mental health when they take medication. And there are different processes for different um, different things, but it's just the, the point being that there are biological components to how you feel. Um, another thing we could look at would be um, uh, trauma and the way that affects your brain. Um, and so your brain is wired to protect itself and you've got your prefrontal cortex, which is this front part of your brain. That's the part of you that's thinking and logical and deliberates and makes decisions. And then you've got, um, if you can see here, your um, amygdala, and that's the part of you that has anger and, um, and also is good to respond in, in trauma and stress situations. And the, it's got the basal ganglia, so that's where you have your habitual responses. Um, so if you encounter a situation that your brain determines is life or death, it's going to kick into uh, a trauma state where that part of your brain that's logical and thinking and makes decisions goes completely offline. Um, not completely, but it weakens to the point that you're really not using it very much. And these other parts of your brain take over. Um, and that's a biological thing um, for people who have experienced it, though, they might be able to even describe how um, when they were in that situation, they weren't really able to think in the same way that they normally are. And there's a biological reason for that. Um, so if I were to you know, talk to my 11 year old self, I'm not entirely sure exactly what was going on biologically in my brain. Um, there's plenty of other ways biology works aside from medication, um, but like exercise, right? That type of thing. So I wasn't really exercising very much. Um, there were a lot of things about uh, my biology that probably were impacting how I felt. Uh, and it's possible that there was even something going on chemically in my brain. Um, yeah, so we just talked about trauma. So we'll, we'll transition to another factor. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's pretty common for me um, to have people come into my um, office that have experienced um, different traumas. Um, and so there's one person I remember um, so he was a young man and he had gone on a missions trip. And when he came back, his family felt like he had completely changed. Um, they didn't know what was going on. His personality was super different. He was really short tempered where he hadn't been before. Um, and he experienced nightmares every night, um, couldn't sleep, was constantly afraid, used to like partying and going out um, and then just didn't want to didn't want to interact with anybody and stay at home. And so when he came in, um, in for sessions to talk to me, he told me that while he had been on the missions trip, he had had a time where he was alone and he had actually had someone who commit a crime against him. And that had completely changed how his brain was functioning at that point. Um, and you know, trauma is a common reason that people come in for therapy and there's definitely healing for that. Um, but that, that is something that um, can deeply affect somebody and how how their brain is functioning and so when we think about that we can kind of think about that in, in a lot of ways as other people's sin and how it affects our mental health um so crimes traumas and abuses are um are things that will affect us um or just an everyday selfishness or conflict of needs that you have with somebody else maybe people participating in unjust systems in the world whether in intentionally or unintentionally um and so, um, yeah, that, this is definitely something, um, and, and we can even talk about maybe even in the discussion, if you want, what, how you think of sin, I know people think of it in a variety of different ways. So if I was gonna think about it, the most broad definition I could think of is just relationships and systems that miss the mark of God's wholeness. Um, and sometimes that can be because someone is deliberately doing something and sometimes someone's accidentally doing something or negligently not doing a thing that they're supposed to do. Um, but these these are things that impact us and for sure i could see that for for myself growing up that there were certain um traumas that were in my home growing up um that were the result of of actions that other people took and that had happened for for me when i was 11 by then for years and that also um was greatly contributing to what i was feeling at that point in my life um, and this is an easy one to see in the Bible. We kind of start 
right off the bat in Genesis with um, how sin gets passed down from one person to another uh, and that we have Cain and, and killing his brother Abel. So that wasn't really Abel's fault. Um, and, and that's kind of how we can think of it. There's sometimes components of what we're experiencing for sure that aren't our fault at all. It could be somebody else that has done something horrible and it might even really be connected to sin and that it's somebody else's sin. Um, but it, it deeply um, impacts others. Um, so yeah, then we can, we can think about now, um, I often, I worked in the Christian Counseling Center for um, Biola University. And so it would be pretty common um, for me to see um, people who would come in to session and, um, and they would, you know, be very hesitant to trust me. Um, and they, they would feel like, you know, I can kind of handle all this by myself. I'm actually not even sure I need therapy. Um, and at that time too, they would also kind of, they would ignore, um, they would ignore uh, God's presence in their life. He didn't feel very present to them either, actually. Um, and then you, I would notice as, um, as therapy went on and, and they started to trust me a bit more and we started to work together, um, that they uh, would become actually even more aware of God's presence in their life, which was a really interesting thing to see. Um, I also remember I worked in a men's prison um, and there was a patient who, who came to see me and um, he was actually pretty convinced that God hated him. Um, and he came into session and he was also pretty convinced that I hated him. And um, we, we worked together for probably about a year and, and towards the end of the year, um, I, you know, as a therapist, I don't share the gospel with people in session. I don't talk about God. I, it's really a space for them to work through their own stuff, but I had certainly been praying for him. And one of the really cool things that happened that year was that as the year went on, um, in the beginning of the year, someone came and gave him a track and he completely blew it off. He wasn't, he was, he told me about it in session. He did not like it. Um, and then as we engaged in therapy and he started to understand that I definitely truly cared about him and was there to help him. And he began to be able to trust me more. Um, then he went, um, it was later in the year that somebody else gave him a Bible and he was so much more open to it. He was, uh, he believed it was possible that maybe God could love him and could care for him. Um, and so by the time that I had, um, left that year of working in the prison, he was actually attending um, church and um, reading his Bible pretty regularly. It was a really cool thing to see. So what this brings up is the, um, the relational and the developmental parts of people's mental health, which is such a huge topic. This is such a drop in the bucket to this. This is actually where I would normally um, spend a lot of my time thinking about what's going on um, for people. Um, but one, one, this, this thing that I'm describing to you all is something called attachment. So attachment styles are, are ways that our, our minds create a template for how we think relationships work in the world. Um, everybody's got one. It happens um, really based off of the interactions you have with the person who took care of you the most when you were really young and you were growing up. And it can change throughout life. It's, it's, it's a complicated thing. But in general, uh, we, we learn from that first relationship that we have while we're growing up. And so there's, um, you could say there's four attachment styles, or if we wanted to really simplify it, we could say that there's two, there's secure and insecure. Um, so secure attachment would be a, a more healthy attachment style. When you're securely attached, you believe um, that you can turn to others for help, but that you can also rely on yourself for help. Um, and then there's different kinds of insecure attachment. So there's an anxious attachment and that's where you feel like I can't cope by myself. I need somebody else to help me cope. Avoidant attachment is where you think I can rely completely on myself. I don't need anybody else. And the disorganized attachment is you kind of don't know any, it changes, it shifts at any given time. So there's a really cool study, a really common study that you may have heard of um, called the strange situation. Um, and so what they did was they had children that were, I think about two years old um, and their parent would bring them to this room and then the parent would leave and then the parent would come back. Um, and so that's where we got these four categories, noticing the different kinds of behaviors that children had. So the securely attached child and the parent would leave. They cared about their parent. Um, I mean, all these children care about their parents, but they, you know, they missed their parent. They wanted their parent to be there and they cried, but then they became okay. They were able to play with the person who was in the room with them. And when their parent came back, they were so happy to see them. They gave them a hug. 
Um, but the anxiously attached children, when their parents left, they cried and they cried and they didn't stop. And when their parents came back, they continued to cry. They could not be comforted. Um, the avoidantly attached children, um, when their parents left, they didn't really notice. It didn't, it didn't bother them. And when their parents came back, they didn't really have a very strong reaction either. Um, and so this is what it looks like in children. It looks different as you get older, but that attachment style stays with you throughout life. Um, and you can, you can have something called an earned secure attachment where you kind of work through some of um, the ways that you relate with others and are able to then relate in a more secure way. But a lot of people have an insecure attachment. So if, if you notice some of those things inside yourself, don't be alarmed. Um, uh, I would say for myself growing up, um, I had a, an avoidant attachment style. I kind of relied on myself and didn't reach out to others for help. Um, and that's certainly for my 11 year old self contributed to a lot of what I was experiencing. Cause I felt like I was dealing with it, um, all alone. I wasn't really able to take in other people's help at that point. Um, the next factor that we'll talk about, um, is one that I feel like uh, people have probably heard a lot about hopefully this past year. Um, so, you know, you can think about as an example, all of the violence that's happened this past year, especially racially based violence um, that certainly impacts um, people's mental health. So really I would kind of label this all the broken systems in the world and they often are expressed in isms. So racism, classism, ableism, sexism, um, there are these power structures in the world um, and they affect people. And so, um, you know, this can be big or small, right? So following racially based violence, it's really common for people who fall in that category to experience um, symptoms of vicarious trauma, to experience um, anxiety and stress. Um, it's also in everyday interactions. Um, we can do studies and see that people who are minorities in a class um, and are taking a test, there's something called minority stress and, and that it that affects um, the amount of stress that they're feeling when they're taking a test. So there's there's all of these different things and that impacts mental health, that increase in stress um, impacts mental health um, for sure. We can definitely um, see examples of this in the scripture. So I feel like a really cool example is um, what happens with Jesus in the pools of Bethesda. And there's a man um, and there's this pool that when it, I think it bubbles, um, people can get healed if, if they enter the pool. And so a lot of people who were um, disabled in some way would hang out near that pool and hope to be there when the spring started to bubble up and then they'd try and go get healed. But there's a man who's paralyzed and Jesus sees him um, and he's not able to make it into the pool. There's a system set up where there are people scrambling ahead of him and he does not have the ability um, to enter the pool for himself. And so Jesus actually meets him where he at, he's at and asks him if he wants to be healed and heals him right then and there. Um, you know, Jesus saw his experience. Um, and certainly the Bible talks all over the place um, from start to finish really about the systems of oppression in our world. The biggest, um, not biggest, but one of the big images that we get is the Exodus, right? And this is where God looks at his people and he says, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and I've heard their outcry because of their taskmasters, for I'm aware of their sufferings. Um, God knows that, that these systems of oppression cause suffering. Um, and so that's, that's one that's really clear and really important. It could certainly be a whole um, talk or course of its own. Um, oops. Oh no, what's going on? Okay, here we go. Um, and so then we'll, we'll move on to another factor. So, um, there's cognitive components to your mental health. So cognitive meaning like the things that you think. So you'll hear people say things like, if you change the way you think you can change the way you feel. Um, if you change your perspective, it's gonna, it's gonna, um, really help you. And so, yeah, I, I would say that, I for sure when I was 11 was experienced that experiencing that and I'll give you guys some examples because there are so many in this category of what I could mean by like changing your thinking um, but there's some really common ones they're called like um, cognitive distortions is what we call them um, just ways of thinking that are not correct and also not helpful um, so for example some people will only notice when things go wrong and they'll ignore when they work out so they'll feel like oh nobody ever wants to talk to me and they'll look at every time that they 
tried to start a conversation with somebody and they didn't respond, but they won't look at any of the times that somebody um, did respond to them. And so when you do that, you don't feel great about yourself. You feel like people don't like you uh, and you're more likely to think that it's about you and then it can just really spiral. Um, there's also emotional reasoning. So like feeling what you, just because you feel something that it's true. So I feel like God hates me, so he must hate me. Uh, but that's not really the way to figure out whether or not God hates you, whether, whether you feel it or not, but that can become um, the way that you, you think about it. Um, there's also black and white thinking. Um, so your motives either come from a pure God-loving place or from your sinful nature. When in reality, with so many things from um, where your motives are coming from or you know, what a person is doing, it's, it's, it's more a both and um, all the time. And so it's very rare that anybody has a pure God-loving place that they're coming from. And honestly, I would say it's from my experience working with people, it's pretty rare for someone to have things that are purely motivated by like awful, evil, sinful intentions. Um, it's usually kind of a mix of both. And sometimes the proportions are heavily tipped in, in one, one realm, but, um, but it's, it's usually a combo of both. Um, Another would be some of these more um, ex extreme generalized statements, like I'm only lovable if I'm perfect. I think for me, when I was 11, I definitely would have been feeling that. I didn't feel like God could love me if there was something wrong with me or if I, if I wasn't um, being, again, the perfect Christian. You could even hear that in the way that I said it. And that believing that about myself and thinking that way really... Um, really impacted my ability to believe that I was even level, which obviously did not make me feel happy at all. Um, uh, it did not make me feel well at all. Um, and then I, I like this one too. I learned this one at the, at the men's prison. They, they called it shitting on yourself. You shouldn't shit on yourself. <laughs> oh, it's a fun little play on words there. Um, but um, people will often say, I shouldn't feel grief. I shouldn't be angry about this. I shouldn't be lonely. Um, instead of acknowledging that, that that is how you're feeling right now, and most likely it's actually probably okay. Um, there might be not be, there might be things you don't want to do. So like maybe I shouldn't hit somebody is probably okay to say, but um, but you know getting frustrated with yourself for for what you're experiencing um, when that's kind of out of your control um, isn't helpful and it can just lead to people feeling super super guilty all the time. Um, so we can see in Romans that for sure the way that we think is important, uh, really famous, highly quoted verse, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind is super important. Um, and it's important to, you know, look at the way that you're thinking and how that might be impacting you. Um, yes. So we can look at another example here. Um, and this is, this is kind of the one that I was the most interested in um, learning about when I went to grad school, because it was one of the questions I felt like was, I wouldn't get answered if I hadn't gone to a Christian grad school. Uh, and so, but this story though is, is really important. Um, and so um, there was a girl that I, that I grew up on, uh, not grew up on, grew up with. Um, and she, you know, as we were getting towards the end of high school would say things to me like, I feel like people are following me. Um, I, you know, I've been, you know, hearing a voice that's not there. Um, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that somebody's after me, right? These, these really troubling experiences that she was having. Um, now we weren't super, super close, but we did end up going to the same college and somewhere midway through college, she and I had some mutual friends and they invited me over because they wanted to pray for her. Um, and, you know, they interpreted the experiences that she was having as demonic possession. And so they engaged in like a sort of an exorcism sort of prayer. Um, and they were yelling and they were talking very sternly, um, trying to cast a demon out of her. And unfortunately, it didn't help her at all. Um, what did end up helping her is about a year later, she got diagnosed with schizophrenia and she was given medication to treat that. Um, but as the years went on and we talked more, um, she was sharing with me how painful and hurtful it was um, to have people trying to cast a demon out of her. It made her feel more frightened. It made it harder for her to recover. It made her feel like people thought that she was a demon. Um, and so this, this factor, I feel like it's a really um, 
important one to consider is what is a, the impact directly of maybe your spiritual realm, your spiritual self on your mental health. Um, so I will say that I, you know, I don't have all the answers on exactly when to know if something is or isn't a demonic um, presence, if that's something that happens, if that's something that happens in certain contexts, but on ours, that's a whole other discussion to have, but I'm certainly open to that reality. Um, but I would say that at least when it comes to that sort of an issue where you're thinking about trying to, you know, cast a demon out of a person in a way that could be something that's very scary for them, I would highly encourage um, maybe the involvement of a mental health professional first, <laughs> um, because there can be incredible damage and trauma that people experience in the church because people are trying to cast demons out of them. Um, but that spirituality mental health is not just that. That's a very specific issue. It's one that weighs heavy on me, but it's a, it's a very specific one, uh, but it's a bigger topic. And that includes how you feel towards God when you experience mental health troubles. What's your relationship with God like? Um, how is maybe God using your mental health struggles in the process of sanctifying you and helping you grow and helping you heal? Um, how is he involved in the process of your healing? Um, all of these are great questions um, and all have their own answers. Um, I, you know, the interesting thing I told you guys before about attachment styles, secure versus insecure. And, um, uh, we also have attachment to God as well. Actually, God is a, a relationship that we can have in our life that actually has a real impact on, um, how we experience the world and cope with the world. And, and so we can be securely or insecurely or avoidantly attached to God. Um, and so that's another place where, again, your spirituality, your relationship with God, um, can play a role in your mental health. Um, if you're securely attached to God, that's a really great thing. Um, and if you're insecurely attached to God, that might be impacting your mental health in a more negative way. Um, so back to my original question when I was 11, trying to figure out like, am I doing something wrong here? Um, what's, what's wrong with me? Um, and so, you know, what's the role of maybe personal sin? And I'm going to make it even more specific because, again, we could kind of talk about what does it really mean um, for there to be sin? Because you could say, like, sin is involved in creating systems of oppression of the world. Like, all of this is kind of the ways that this world is broken and fallen short. And I feel like that's a fair thing to say. Um, but I think what, what I meant when I was 11 and what people often mean is, like, am I purposely doing something wrong here that I should be, um, should be able to stop on my own without help? You know, just... Am I willfully rebelling against God in the way that he wants me to live? Because he's telling me to, to be joyful in him and I can't be joyful in him right now because of the way that I'm feeling. Um, and so what I would say is, yeah, that's it's part of it too, right? It's, it's part of it too. Uh, the question is to what extent, because there's all of these different things going on. Um, and in some cases, like we think about like trauma, like there might be like 0% personal sin, like you didn't do anything wrong when that trauma happened and you still had to reap the, the consequences of that and you have to go through the healing process for that. Um, so but being reasonable, um, our sin, you know, we're all imperfect people. We all do things wrong. I would say that it's important to recognize that that, that is a cause and a symptom. So um, when, you know, when I was 11, I'm depressed and I'm struggling to, to cope with that. Um, I, the, the lashing out and the being angry and critical of others was something that was pointing to a deeper problem. It wasn't just that I wanted to be mean towards others. Um, so I can see that and it's maybe, maybe it isn't the way that I want to be in, in God's new kingdom. I don't want to be the kind of person that's kind of hateful and critical and impatient with others. Um, but the real question is, you know, do I want to, to heal from that and move forward? Um, and if so, then I really need to know where that's coming from, because what I will say is just stopping is great if you can. If there's something that you're doing that's like, oh, that's not great. I don't want to, that's probably not the way God wants me to live. And you can just stop it. Then that's fantastic. Do that. But often it, because it's so entangled with so many of these other things, um, it might not be super straightforward how to stop. Um, the solution isn't to say internally, I'm wrong and, and grit my teeth and try and stop it, right? There might be other solutions um, that, that are more helpful to you, um, that actually results in a decrease in the thing that you're wanting to stop. Um, and so you can hear, so yeah, so if we look at all these different things and we could actually look at even more factors, again, this is my more brief overview. Um, you can look at it and, and at in any given situation, 
each of these different factors may play a different percentage of the role or they might interlap or, or tangle over. So it might be that the systems of the world and, and your development in biology are the really big players. And some of these other things are contributing, but they're a little bit smaller, or it could be, um, it could be a different configuration where there's a little bit more emphasis on the biology and the environment, or it could be really about how you're thinking and changing your perspective could be really helpful. It's so complicated. So we come back again to the idea of wisdom. This is why it's not so simple and straightforward to just sit there and go, this is what's going on. Um, and this is how I'm going to, to fix it. This is why it's helpful to talk to somebody who can um, look on the outside or can be on the outside of you and help you see more clearly which one of these things is maybe at play and, and, and how to, to interact with that. Um, and so I'll just end this little section of this question just to note a note about guilt and shame. As you can kind of hear me emphasizing this conflict um, that I had around sin. And, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with admitting that we're imperfect, that we've fallen short of what God wants us to be, that we miss the mark. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. The thing that I'm concerned about often is the way that um, often as Christians, we use guilt and shame as the motivators for our change. And so um, I don't really see that in the Bible as the motivator for change. So um, when we talk about guilt, it's actually more just a status that you have with God. It's not, um, there's nothing about, you know, and your guilt leads you to the life that God wants you to have. Um, and shame is a bit more complicated, but also is not used in that way. Um, and so, you know, we've got verses that talk about what leads us to repentance, what leads us to the life that God wants us to have. And in second Corinthians seven ten, we see that it's actually, um, what does this translation say? Uh, the sorrow, so godly sorrow, some translations say, so the godly sorrow, um, that produces repentance and Romans two, four, um, talks about how it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. So that's, that's where we're going to be able to move towards who God wants us to be. There might be sorrow, like, oh, I, this isn't the way that it should be. I wish it could be different. Um, and, and when it comes to God, it's actually the love and the kindness that he's shown us that leads us to the kind of change that we need to make in our life. And so again, we'll kind of revisit the idea of what does it look like when God's working in our life? If it isn't just heaps of guilt and shame that we're feeling. Um, and what the work of God's spirit looks like is the fruit of God's spirit and that's love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I just read that different than the translation, but, um, it's a verse that I think a lot of people are pretty familiar with. Um, when you look and you see those kinds of things happening, you know, that God is at work and what's going on. So we got our question too, can Christians go to therapy? Um, so. I'm going to give you my very uh, long um, dissertation on that. I think the answer is yes. Um, and if, if you wanted me to say it a different way, I would say absolutely. And um, if you wanted me to even give it to you in a third way, I'd say, please, I promise we're nice. I promise we're not that bad. <laughs> I swear. Um, so I'll bring us to a, a common question that Christians will ask if they think about therapy. Um, so does it have to be a Christian therapist though? How important is that? Um, and so what I'll say to that is not necessarily, there's nothing wrong with seeing a Christian therapist. I, myself being a Christian therapist, hope that there's nothing wrong with seeing a therapist who's Christian. <laughs> um, it can be really helpful. So when, um, you know, in, in my life, I've had, um, I'd say summarize it by like saying three different therapists in my life. Um, and one of them um, was a Christian therapist who wasn't very well trained and actually was, you know, using the Bible a lot to try and help me understand things, but didn't really have the wisdom. And it was actually really harmful for me. Um, but then I also saw a Christian therapist who was really able to talk with me about my relationship with God, who was able to talk with me, um, about all of the things that I needed to talk about to address my mental health. Um, and she was super helpful. And then my current therapist um, isn't a Christian, I don't think. Um, we'll, we'll just say that she's not, she certainly doesn't believe exactly the same things that I do all the time. Um, but, but the idea, if you're going to therapy, is that your therapist isn't supposed to be telling you what to believe one way or another. That's really supposed to be your journey. Um, you're supposed to be figuring that out. Um, and so I've actually had some of my most profound um, 
understandings of who God is in therapy with my therapist who isn't a Christian. Um, the important thing was that I had a conversation with her up front about um, what, what, how important it was to me that she didn't look at my faith as like something that was wrong with me. Um, and having that conversation with her and seeing that like she's super open to it and, and wasn't going to try and convince me of any particular theological belief um, getting on the same page with that was important. And I would definitely say that's important. Um, but there might be people who aren't Christian who are still going to give you space to process what you need to process about God. Um, so yes, so those, those are the options. You can see a Christian therapist or you can see a therapist who isn't Christian. And then if your faith is something important to you, I would just always recommend having a conversation with that therapist up front about how they view that and, and seeing if you can come to a place where you feel comfortable with their answer to that question. So um, what are your options? Um, so if you're trying to find a good therapist, um, any therapist who's Christian, who has an LCSW, LPC, PhD, PsyD, MFG, LMFT, these are all different types of licenses that, um, people can have or degrees slash licenses. Um, and then again, any Christian, any therapist who isn't Christian with the above, um, I would say that if, you know, if you're not experiencing maybe this, uh, mental health, um, diagnosis level problem, but you're wanting to just engage in a process of learning more about yourself, because even if you're not necessarily depressed, you might want to learn more about yourself and grow and, and talking to that physician of the soul. Um, as Christians, we believe that everybody um, is in the process of being sanctified and growing and, and working through the stuff that they've got going on inside of them. And so that can always be helpful. Um, and so pastoral counseling, having a mentor or discipler, a wise elder in your life, um, that's great for like non-mental health issues um, that still require counsel. And then I've also uh, have, so I currently see a therapist who's in Christian, but then I also go to something called spiritual direction. And so that's a very specific kind of person who sits with you and uh, talks to you about your relationship with God. And um, they're really fantastic. At least the one that I have is really fantastic. <laughs> um, I could give, if I could give her to everybody, I would. Um, I would say that I recommend against uh, with, with a qualification, I re recommend against biblical counseling. Um, that's a really popular form of Christian therapy. Um, and so what I'll say about that is I feel like biblical counseling could kind of fall into the same category for, for me as like pastoral counseling or mentor disciple or like, and there's wonderful human beings who are biblical counselors. And I'm, it's possible that even some people here who have gone to biblical counseling and have found it really beneficial for them. And I, I'm not trying to call any of that into question. If you're seeking out therapy, though, because you're trying to address um, anxiety or depression or something like that, unfortunately, I, at least my personal belief is that the model that biblical counseling uses actually claims to be using only the Bible to help solve the problems. And unfortunately, um, the Bible actually points to us having uh, wisdom using um, general revelation. So to completely ignore um, wisdom, to completely ignore general revelation um, really cuts out some really key things that help people. And so I wouldn't be able to say for sure that if you were having that kind of an issue that someone who provides biblical counseling um, would be able to address that with the training that they've received. But again, if you've had positive experiences, don't discount those because um, it, there's wonderful people in, in all fields. Um, and um, and again, it would be probably really great if you were trying to work out a specific like theological issue or like a specific, almost like spiritual direction, maybe. I feel like it could be really helpful. Uh, and then in all situations, I recommend against conversion therapy. That's also a Christian form of therapy that tries to change someone's sexual orientation. Um, that type of therapy has been found to be harmful um, and to uh, increase mortality among the LGBTQ community. Um, and so there's definitely options for Christians who are from the LGBTQ community to go to therapy, uh, I would recommend very strongly against conversion therapy. Um, so is therapy the only thing you need? So this is where you go, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm going to talk to somebody. They're going to help me address um, my mental health needs. And, um, and so you think like, okay, you can kind of think of it like um, if you go to a dentist, you don't need them to be Christian because they can address the thing that's going on in your mouth with your teeth. And so if there's biological components to your mental health, certainly somebody who's not a Christian can address that. Um, 
uh, because they also know about the biology, but, it, but isn't there something different about therapy? And I'd kind of say, yeah, for sure. There's something different because you're talking about who you are as a person and that much more directly relates to your faith and who you are as a person. So, um, I would say the first thing is that any healing that's happening is I think God's, um, movement in our life. And so always invite God into that process and, and be aware that he's there with you as you're going through that process. Um, and then find yourself spaces where you can process your relationship with God. So if you're with a Christian therapist or a therapist, like the one that I have, who's not Christian, but is super open um, to giving me the space to processing that, um, you already have that, but if you want some more direct, you know, counsel on that, then certainly as you're, you know, just like if you had cancer, you, you might go to an oncologist, but then also go to your church and ask them to pray for you. Certainly, I feel like that as Christians is an important thing to do, to invite God into the process in the way that makes the most sense to you. Um, and then, yes, yeah, spiritual disciplines pair really well with um, therapy. So there's a lot of, a lot of overlap that, that can be had. And some of it might be addressing your mental health, but then others, other parts of it might um, build up your, your spiritual life with God. Um, which will bring us to our third question. What's the relationship between faith and mental health? So this is going to be very quick um, and then we can get to discussion question and answers. But um, so my dissertation <laughs> would say that it goes both ways. So my dissertation was on attachment to God um, and how it helps people um, to recover from and or um, not develop mental health problems. Um, and so, you know, what we found was that having a secure attachment, a secure relationship with God um, increases people's resilience. And also people that are already um, have um, strong mental health or, you know, already have a secure attachment to God uh, will already have a secure attachment to God. So it goes both ways. It, um, generally working, like, it, like the example I shared with about the patient um, who, um, wasn't open to receiving the track at the beginning of the year, but then at the end of the year was in the Bible studies and all of that. Improving his mental health actually helped him to understand God better. Um, so you can kind of see it's just, a, it's a two-way street. Um, uh, and so it's a two-way street and, and it's a two-way street for both good and for, and for bad. So some of the ways that um, faith can negatively impact your mental health is if there's certain theologies, you know, we talked about maybe some cognitive distortions, there might be some theologies that aren't are not accurate and they might have a very negative impact on the way you view yourself, the way you think that God views you. Um, and sometimes if you're having a mental health problem, that might cause you to have a spiritual struggle to really wrestle with God and to not feel like you're able to connect with him, um, to not understand maybe God in the same way and to have trouble um, holding your faith. Um, and then there's also religious trauma. So you're in church and, and there are plenty of people in churches who take advantage of others. Um, just like in other places where people have power um, or just where people gather, really. Um, and so there can be trauma um, that comes along with our faith. Um, and then there's benefits. So I just wanted to end with some of the benefits. This is, again, the most practical uh, piece of it. There are a lot of benefits. Um, I could talk about that for a whole other presentation. Um, but there are spiritual disciplines that really improve your mental health. There are things that people who even aren't Christian would do uh, but then we have that added component of it being a part of our, our walk with God. And so uh, meditation, solitude, um, centering prayers, these types of things are super helpful for people in decreasing anxiety and stress um, and in coping with all sorts of mental health problems. Um, and then sharing daily life with other Christians. This one's so big. Um, finding ways to stay connected with meals and games and hikes and talks. So things that we do that aren't directly related to maybe a Bible study, but they're a huge part of Christian life that we've seen modeled in the scriptures that, that they lived life together as a church. Um, and that's so good for, for our mental health and also for our spiritual well-being. Um, memorizing scripture with important truths, going on prayer walks, things like that. Um, I would love to hear maybe even in the discussion um, section, you know, what kinds of things you've found helpful for yourself. Um, so the conclusion is basically that the Bible, church history, and general relation all provide us insight as Christians into where mental health problems come from. Uh, it's incredibly complex and requires wisdom to understand. And if needed, Christians should absolutely have no hesitation to go to therapy. Um, there's lots of options, both Christian, 
um, therapists and even therapists who aren't Christian that can be super helpful to us. Um, just, you know, rem be mindful as a Christian then of just inviting God into that process. Um, and then yes, faith and mental health are so intertwined in both directions for good and for bad. So it kind of, yeah, it goes in, in all sorts of different directions um, and is very, very related. <laughs>